So headaches is, is a topic that we've never done a seminar about, which was surprising to me when I was coming up with ideas for a seminar because it is such a common issue, right? Um, but what, when, we, when I started doing some research and looking into headaches, I, I found that I think the reason we've never really addressed headaches as a topic is that it's such a huge topic when you look at it from a functional medicine perspective. So we're gonna try to give you um, just enough info to be dangerous when it comes to headaches, um, but uh, understand that this really is, uh, like I said, a, a confetti style seminar where we're gonna look at a, a lot about a lot instead of a little about a little. So bear with me through that. Um, jot some, some notes down for yourself. If you have questions, we will probably have plenty of time to get to all of your questions. You don't have to share me with anybody tonight. That's the best deal for you. Um, and then uh, I'll try to kind of cover the slides that I have and then we can dive deeper if we want to. Sound okay? All right, so I titled this Uncommon Solutions for a Common Problem for a reason because headaches are a really common problem, right? Like if you think about, so I was trying to think of things that are relatively common, like say heart attacks, right? So everybody kind of knows a lot about those or uh, like an infectious disease like malaria, right? Most of us haven't had malaria. Most of us haven't had a heart attack. Um, but we know so much more about treating those disorders than we do about treating headaches, which is something much more common, right? I mean, everybody in this room probably would raise their hand if I asked, have you had a headache, right? You know what that feels like. So it's inexplicable to me that we haven't really come up with a better solution for that. Um, I think the reason is, is because there is a very common treatment for headaches, um, and that's NSAIDs, or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So can anybody name one of those drugs that you might use? Yeah, ibuprofen. Aleve, Excedrin. Tylenol is the big one, right? Acetaminophen. All of these different um, NSAID type category drugs are used to treat headaches. It's one of the most common things, right? It's, it's so common that you don't even ask your doctor anymore, right? I have a headache, what should I do? It's ubiquitous everywhere. Unfortunately, these drugs have some pretty serious side effects. I wrote some of them up there. Ironically, one of the side effects is headache, which I thought was ridiculous. But, right, I mean, we, we don't consider a lot of these things um, and, until they become a problem. And that's the other thing. You're not likely to get liver, oops, liver damage from one round of ibuprofen for one headache. But if you have chronic headaches and you're taking ibuprofen even every other day, then some of these things become very, very statistically likely for you to have problems with later. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't like to think about later. We just want the headache to go away now. But I think we can do better, especially for those people that have those chronic headaches. So that's really what we're going to talk about tonight is the better. What can we do to treat these things better, these very common problems? So functional medicine approach is always going to talk about finding the cause. Um, you'll see across the top of this presentation, a lot of the titles will be the root cause, right? Or getting to the root. Um, and we talk about the root because that's an easy way to picture things. I often think about functional medicine in terms of a tree or a plant. The roots are being what we're trying to get at and they're hidden underground, so we have to dig them up, right? The analogy is very, very easy to see. The symptoms are the branches and the leaves. So you could pluck all the leaves off, right? Treat all the symptoms, but you're still going to have a problem with the tree, right? So we want to make sure that we're treating at the, at the cause or at the root. So I listed a couple different causes. Muscular tension, we always think of tension headaches, right? We'll talk about categories in a moment. Mechanical joint dysfunction, what do you think I mean there? TMJ would be one of them. Yeah, the, uh, the joint causing pain. We're in a chiropractic office. What do you, I mean, it's not that hard to imagine. Right neck, thinking dysfunction in the joints of the neck, whether that's arthritis or just a fixation, you know, an area in the spine that's not moving. Uh, hormones, we're gonna talk a lot about that, particularly female hormones. Um, with migraines, we will often see cyclical 
interaction between hormones and severity or frequency of migraines, right? And a lot of times if we break that cycle with the, with the hormones, if we can disconnect those two things, then the, the headaches go away. Mm -hmm. So that's something we talk about. Um, detoxification, our liver and kidneys, ability to get things out that aren't supposed to be there. <coughs> Excuse me. Neurotransmitters, um, so that's the actual impulses going on in our brain. Leaky gut, food sensitivity, nutrient deficiency, um, particularly magnesium. We'll talk a lot about magnesium tonight. Uh, sinus pressure, inflammation. Um, that bottom word, multifactorial, means pick any five of those and they're probably in play all at the same time. Right? Which is what makes functional medicine hard, complicated, and awesome. Right? Because if you can sort of piece out and, and tweak here and tweak here and tweak here, instead of just trying to squash with anti-inflammatories, then you get, like, then we get a better result than if you were just to do that. So that's, multifactorial is often uh, not how we like to look at medicine. We like to find out what's wrong with me, right? Dr. Kate, what's, what's going on? What's wrong with me? What, is it this, is it this, is it this? Well, it's probably all of those things, right? At least a little bit. But that's okay, because we can handle this, this, and this, right? We can do all of those things. So that's what's exciting about something that's multifactorial, is that if you find something that's off and you treat it, likely you're helping the problem. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Categories of headaches. We've got your classic tension headache. This is the one that most people can relate to, right? They know what it's like to feel that back of the neck moving up into the head. Everything feels tight and sore. They maybe feel sore in the muscles of the shoulders. Um, it can be muscular or joint related or both. Usually those play together. It can even um, start to pinch on some nerves, right? And then you have the neurologic system involved. Those tension headaches are sometimes the easiest to treat as opposed to something like a migraine where there's lots of different types and causes. And they're typically more severe, longer lasting, more chronic. Uh, you can see too, they're more common in women. I think a lot because of that hormone component, right? That a lot of women, women's hormones are more complicated than men's. That's just all there is to it. And so when you have a more complex system, there's more things that can go wrong. And so I think that helps or that um, makes migraines more prevalent in women as well but they they do affect one in seven which is that's a high number right i mean that's you would think that would be a kind of a public health crisis right i mean how how common that is um but we don't see the public health crisis until 30 years of ibuprofen land you in organ failure you know what i mean like we're not again we're not getting at the root cause which is the headache we're just seeing the effects of the treatment later so all of that goes back to functional medicine. And then another common type of headache are sinus or allergy headaches. Often seasonal, you feel them in the front of your face. You feel full, you feel pressure, right? Your ears hurt, your, your face hurts, your eyes hurt and water. So that's something that oftentimes, if we can parse out what we're dealing with, that helps us figure out how to treat as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So root, one of the root causes we're gonna talk about is magnesium. Um, magnesium deficiency has a lot of research in a lot of different areas, but specifically for tension headaches, we want to think about magnesium. Um, it, it has to do with that ability for the muscle to relax. And if you're not, you know, if you don't have enough magnesium, you're going to be prone to muscle cramps, aches and pains, um, spasticity, and even those tension headaches and even migraines. Um, the problem with uh, magnesium is that it's kind of hard to get a lot of it in your body at once. Um, I, was doing, I was doing some research for this and um, I realized that even some of the times when I'm recommending magnesium, I'm not recommending enough because I'm nervous about gastrointestinal effects, right? So when people tell me, hey, you know, I'm, I've already been taking magnesium, I'm like, well, you should take more, that's not enough, I'm nervous that they're going to have that upset. What happens is in, in the citrate form of magnesium, which is the more common form that you're going to find in supplements, um, that citrate stays in the gut and it pulls fluid, from it, so it pulls fluid back into the 
inside of the colon and it creates loose stools, right? It doesn't let you absorb that fluid back into your body like you should. So that's something we have to kind of counteract. Um, have you heard of milk of magnesia? Right? That's what that is, magnesium citrate. There's a reason that it does what it does, right? So we use the glycinate form instead. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. I want to jump back. I skipped something on migraines that I thought was really interesting. One of the reasons behind migraines that they, they've theorized is that the veins or the vessels, arteries and veins in your head actually are dysregulating their constriction and relaxation, right? You've heard of this. So the veins either slam shut or they flood open and it creates that pressure in the head, that throbbing and the Right, so they t teach all sorts of tricks. Right, stand in the shower with an ice pack on your neck, right, to try to hijack that vasoconstriction. Well, magnesium is, plays a big role in that ability for the, the vessels to know when they're supposed to constrict and relax. So that's one connection that they found with the migraines and magnesium, right, that it's supposed to help prevent that. So again, back to the type of magnesium. Magnesium glycinate is the absorbable form, okay? Um, I had pamphlets somewhere, if you guys want more information about magnesium glycinate, that pamphlet um, talks a lot about that. But this is the type that does not stay in your gut and create gastrointestinal problems. So I can dose up to 600, 800 milligrams with no problem, which is what the research is telling. Hmm? How much magnesium <clears throat> Well, it kind of depends on what you're, if you're just making sure you have enough magnesium in your body, then usually I recommend two of those magnesium glycinates a day. Um, I'll often use that. Now, I'm sort of changing my tune a little bit. So for people that I'm worried about being magnesium deficient, I'm actually, since, this, since I did this research, I'm actually recommending they do four to get up to 400 as opposed to just 200 for maintenance. So that's something, and the nice thing about it is you can take it any time of day, you know, split it up, do two twice a day or two three times a day with no problem because it's not going to mess with your guts. Yeah, so <coughs> that's a new one for me too. I always used to top out at two. I would do two before bed. You know, it kind of helps relax you for sleep, but that wasn't cutting it all the time. So I'm going to start actually recommending that people take more based on that research that I saw. So magnesium does a bunch of other really important stuff in our body. Um, I'm not going to take a ton of time to talk about that, but anybody that has issues with their bones should also be making sure they take a lot of magnesium because it has a lot to do with bone resorption and you know all of that stuff too. Uh, calcium and potassium balance in the body. So a lot of my older ladies, I'm trying to get them to take a little bit more magnesium or at least eat more magnesium in their diet. It was dark high mineral dense foods. Let's talk about hormones, another root cause. Particularly female hormones, that's where the headaches follow that female cycle. A lot of times they'll get a, a sort of a migraine week right before their cycle starts or even into the cycle. They kind of predict it, okay my migraines are going to get really bad now. Anytime they start or stop any sort of hormone treatment it kind of messes that up too. Um, and they often do have other symptoms as well, like other PMS type symptoms or uh, infertility or, you know, some of the other hormone related symptoms besides just the migraine headaches. Yeah? Would a young uh, mother who's nursing a baby, would that also bring on? Uh, yeah, two trauma? things I think of there. I think of the depletion right, especially with nursing that the, that the body has, and with birth, right, a lot of blood loss most of the time. So you could be really low in some vital nutrients and your hormones don't really know what's going on, they're stuck in one place or one phase or they're trying to start again, right, and that could definitely induce more migraines. A lot of different reasons why that might be the case, but yeah, definitely could be related. Um, so we worry about the estrogen progesterone balance, right? How they kind of do this really sophisticated dance with each other, some rising, some falling at different times throughout the month. Um, and a lot of times if we can help people get rid of extra estrogens that they've picked up for the, from their environment, that's what exogenous means. 
they've gotten estrogens from elsewhere and their body is hanging on to them those estrogens can become very inflammatory to the body and mess up that normal cycle and rhythm so a lot of times we'll use something like this axis endo to try to flush out those extra estrogens and those can come from all over the place so that could be from hormone replacement therapy or taking a birth control pill or it can be exposed to environmental mimics of estrogen think those plastics right they worry a lot about certain plastics being kind of like estrogen enough to trick your body right and that can be a problem um, even the bacteria that live in our gut play a role in this that's the third point intestinal dysbiosis means your bacteria in your gut aren't balanced well and those bacteria can actually pull that so the estrogen is trying to be excreted and those gut bacteria actually break that bond the estrogen gets reabsorbed and it doesn't detox well so that deconjugation happens sometimes we see that a ton with folks that have a condition called small intestinal bowel overgrowth they often will have hormone or detox issues along with that um, a high fat to lean muscle mass can also increase uh, estrogens because fat starts to produce estrogen on its own and that's not regulated very well by the rest of the body it kind of goes rogue and it makes all of these other hormones and the problem is is when you have excess estrogen you have excess fat right so it becomes sort of a vicious cycle of fat production and estrogen production and then often insulin insensitivity just in and of itself especially in women will lead to increased testosterone and estrogen production so a lot of times you'll see <clears throat> even men start to develop estrogen like estrogen features right where men start to grow breast tissue that is all driven by exogenous estrogens right their bodies unless they have some crazy tumor on their pituitary isn't typically going to make a lot of extra hormones but that estrogen can happen from not having good insulin insulin sensitivity so again think type 2 diabetes estrogen extra fat right all of a sudden migraines kick in so that's it's a really interesting cycle that happens with hormones another root cause is a neurotransmitter imbalance <coughs> specifically glutamate and GABA so glutamate is our excitatory right our bringer upper of the brain GABA is our inhibitory it calms the brain and I don't necessarily mean moods when I say that I mean how quickly and how well and how fast and how much our neurons in our brain are firing okay so if you've got too much glutamate they call that excitotoxicity so it's overly excited it's too stimulated and you can actually damage a nerve by asking too much of it right fire 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 right flooding the system and the nerve goes ah I can't do it and so it freaks out and then you have a lot of inflammation that follows from that so that's very connected to migraines as well as neuron damage over time so in this case the migraine might be telling you something right hey listen to me look at me my nerves are dying in my brain because I'm too excited in there right see this a ton in kiddos right where they get migraines out of nowhere often anxious or hyperactive or overactive in the mind and in their brain and if we calm that down with a little bit of GABA right then a lot of those symptoms start to go away how do we get GABA this glutamic acid decarboxylase is in charge so that converts the glutamate to GABA right so they kind of do this thing back and forth if you don't have that or if it's inhibited um, then you end up imbalanced right so it can be inhibited by cortisol where does cortisol come from stress, stress right chronic stress so a lot of people who are chronic, chronically stressed also have migraines there is a connection there um, B6 is what we call a rate limiting step meaning that you need B6 in order to do that conversion okay and if you don't have the B6 there's no way around it so as much B6 as you have is as much of this conversion that you can do because it's limited by that 
Now, a lot of us have trouble with B vitamins because we have a methylation defect in our genes, especially a lot of white women who also tend to have migraines, right? So we wonder how much of this is a B vitamin deficiency, where you're not utilizing and absorbing your, especially B6, so you can't change that glutamate into GABA the way we need to. GABA receptors are also activated by progesterone. Remember, progesterone is opposite of estrogen, right? So if you've got too much estrogen, guess what? That progesterone is going to be inhibited. So not only are you overly done with estrogen, but now you've got GABA that's not being activated because progesterone's too low, right? So that's where the multifactorial comes in, where the root cause might be hormone and neurotransmitter, one leading to the other. So all these systems are really interconnected. The nice thing about this is that when I meet somebody with a migraine, I see a billion different things that I can do to help maximize their body's ability to fight these migraines, right? So I can check B6, I can check GABA, I can check cortisol, I can check magnesium. I mean, we're going to get more and more into that instead of just, well, you get migraines, so here's some anti-inflammatory. Or even a natural anti-inflammatory instead, but instead going, you know, deeper to the root. Uh, toxicity, we kind of touched on that when we talked about the bacteria imbalance, right? That your body isn't able to get things out the way that it should. So the liver is unable to deal with that toxic burden. And those toxins stay in our body and create a ton of inflammation. And headaches, especially chronic migraine headaches, can be really related to that. So there's three different phases of detox. Two happen in the liver and one happen in the kidney. So again, there's a lot of different ways that we can support that detoxification process. And then you have elimination. So that's through stool, sweat, and urine. So if you have a patient who is chronically constipated, do you think they're detoxing well? Probably not, right? They're getting all backed up. So the detox part's working, but if you can't get rid of things, then it sits in your gut and the bacteria put all those toxins right back in, right? So it's not enough to just detox somebody. You have to make sure that they're eliminating. Vice versa, if you're making sure people are eliminating really well, but you're not actually stimulating the liver or the kidneys to do its job, then you're just moving things through, right? So I talk to a lot of people who say, well, Dr. Kate, I do cleanses all the time. My liver must be just perfectly happy. Well, I mean, that's great. You're eliminating really well when you do a cleanse, but are you actually getting the liver to detox? It's kind of hard to know unless you're really putting those things in and measuring the output. So that's something that we talk about a lot too. It's not just about detoxing or cleansing or eliminating. It's both things that need to happen together. So there's tons of ways to upregulate detox. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Sulforaphane is one that I like to talk about. This is a not really new to the scene, newer maybe. Um, <clears throat> it comes from cruciferous vegetables, particularly we think broccoli. Now there's a lot of different anti high antioxidant detox producing things that come from cruciferous vegetables. It's one thing that we try to push people to eat a lot of when they're doing a detox because a lot of those different things are naturally occurring. Um, but the antioxidants and the detox pathways are very specific. So the more specific we can get and the higher concentration we can get of these things at once, the more we push that process. So instead of just telling you to eat, you know, 10 pounds of broccoli a day, which you would get only a tiny fraction of this active ingredient sulforaphane, that detoxer, specific for sulfur, right? That makes sense in the name. Um, if you just take all of that sulforaphane out, make sure it's really easy to absorb, and then take it in a tablet, it's a lot easier. You get a lot more at once. This is one that I'm having most of my women with cancer histories or family history of cancer take this one because there's some really interesting studies on hormone-based cancers and using sulforaphane as a prevention for that. So this is one that a lot of my ladies, especially if they've had hormone-based cancers, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, cervical cancer, 
um, whether it, you know, it was mild, they just had a biopsy, or whether it, you know, it was something they went through chemo and everything for, they'll often just take this as sort of part of their multivitamin. So that's something we've used. I think there's also good studies on it for prostate cancer, right? So it's not just estrogen or progesterone specific for hormones. It's just one that we see a little bit more. And it's antioxidant, right? What do, what do antioxidants do? We know they're good, but what, do you know what they do in the body? Prevent oxidation. Okay, so why does that help us? Oxidation is like rusting um, a piece of metal. It disintegrates. It. Yes, it breaks things down. And the oxidation causes problems in our body. Yeah, it, it injures and, and kills cells. Yeah, for sure. So that's the idea behind anything that's an antioxidant. It's a blanket statement. Antioxidants are good for every part of our body. The detox part of sulforaphane is the specific thing. N-acetylcysteine, or NAC, you may have heard of NAC, N-A-C. Um, this promotes glutathione. Glutathione is particularly important for detoxification of heavy metals. So that's one of the things we can also collect from our environments besides just hormones or other things from like plastics. You can also collect those heavy metals. They get stored in our body and they can create problems. Um, they oxidize things as one of the things. They can be neurotoxins, they can be inflamers. Um, so glutathione is one that helps get rid of those heavy metals. You can't just take glutathione, it doesn't work. So you have to take the precursor for it and your body converts it. Xanthohumol is an interesting one. Uh, this actually comes from hops. And I tell people that and they go, ooh, does this mean I get to drink more beer, Dr. Kate? Hops are good for me. No, that's not the answer. But xanthohumol is from a derivative of hops. It's particularly anti-inflammatory. So you'll see it in a lot of our general anti-inflammatories, ultra inflamex, ultra myocardio, um, but it, it, it's specifically good for that phase two of detox as well. So that's something you'll see in some of our uh, products like Glutaclear. Glutaclear, I think, is the highest uh, NAC and acetylcysteine supplement that we have. So it's a big one that we use for detox, um, especially when we're doing our DVC detox. We add it in, and, and that's one that people will take long, even after they're done doing an official detox, just to make sure that those processes are still working. Root causes, we can't, we can't leave without talking about inflammation. That would be a travesty. I think I would be fired tomorrow if I did not mention inflammation because we know that that's the root of all evils when it comes to the body. Um, that inflammatory process that when it's in check is the best thing. It helps us heal, it helps us grow, right? Inflammation is meant to be good. But when it be overpowers the system, or when it's happening, cr happening chronically, it's a bad thing. So at DBC, we talk a ton about what things that you can do to minimize inflammation, to get more anti-inflammatory into your lifestyle. Um, we want to remove pro-inflammatory foods. List a couple pro-inflammatory foods. Give me something. Potato chips. Potato chips. Oh, but they're so good. Corn oil. What? Corn oil. Cor <laughs> yeah, corn oil. A lot of these manufactured processed oils. Sugar. 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 I saw it back there. Sugar, right? Cheese. Cheese can be very inflammatory, especially if you don't break it down right. That casein molecule can be inflammatory. Dairy. Yep, dairy in general. We pick on gluten a lot here at DBC. That can be very pro-inflammatory to your, to your body as well. Um, but even little things like just, I mean, artificial colors and sweeteners, things that you find in a lot of these health foods, right, that lower calorie count, but they're pretty inflammatory for our bodies. We need to replenish our micronutrients. A lot of the times when we get patients in that are, have been sick for a very long time, we don't do anything specific right away. We just try to make sure that all systems are go, right? That we replace all of these things that have just been depleted and depleted and depleted from their bodies for so long. So even just starting there can make a huge difference. It can take a patient from a, a two to an eight pretty quick without a whole lot of effort and work. Increasing antioxidant rich foods. So we talked about the pro-inflammatory. What are some antioxidant rich foods? Yes, one of my favorites. <coughs> what else? An Antioxidant-rich foods. Think colors. You got one back there. I heard you. Cabbage. 
Strawberries, very good. Beets. Beets. Leafy greens. Leafy greens, very antioxidant rich. Yeah, think, I mean, think your rainbow fruits and vegetables, right? That's going to be the white and the beige leave to the side. They don't have as many nutrients in them as the, the colors. So we often tell people to eat the rainbow. Try to get a food of every different color in every day. And that way you make sure you're getting a lot of those different antioxidant rich foods. Healing the gut is a big part of this. Autoimmunity can also kind of spill into things like migraine headaches, um, cluster headaches, some of those harder to treat ones can have an autoimmune component to them. Um, even tension headaches, right? If you've got a lot of itises, right? Arthritis or, you know, tendonitis or, right? All of these, the itises, the inflamed joints, um, those can even lend themselves or come from autoimmune types of things. So um, healing that gut, making sure that you're not leaking things through and causing that autoimmune phenomenon. <clears throat> I did a seminar um, um, probably half a year ago now about that leaky gut autoimmune connection and it's only becoming stronger and stronger as we do more research into it. We, me, not me, the medical community looks more and more into that, that phenomenon. Um, there was some really interesting research about ketogenic diet. That's all the rage right now is keto. Um, I, goods and bads about keto for sure. Um, but in this research they were talking about a three month trial of nutritional ketosis and it had some pretty staggering results. I was shocked. Average monthly attacks 108 to 31. I don't know how many cluster headache, I mean, nobody would shake their head at that. They, I mean, that would be worth it. That's like from not having a life to having a life. Um, so they even had full resolution where they weren't having any more in 11 out of 18 patients. If this was a drug, they Uh, keto salts, it's beta hydroxybutyrate. It's a salt that you can ingest that throws your body into ketosis for a short period of time. So, ketosis is where your brain is using ketones instead of glucose to function. And it's a more anti inflammatory way for the brain to work. So, it seems like the brain likes to work on ketones a little bit better. And so if you get your brain working on ketones, they're saying that this was for migraines, that there were some pretty promising um, case studies, particularly to the excitotoxicity part. Remember we talked about GABA and glutamate? So if you can get that balanced out with that ketogenic diet, then you might do a lot better with those migraines. So that's something that they're looking into as well. Here at DBC, we worry just a little bit about nutrient density long term, right? Because you cut out a lot of those rainbow foods when you're eating so much fat. And so we want to try to find a happy place where we can enjoy the benefits of that ketogenic diet without losing some of our antioxidants. So that's something that, that we talk about here too. Uh, an anti-inflammatory nutraceutical that we use often is inflavonoid. The three main components that have to do with headaches particularly are turmeric or curcumin, ginger root, and Boswellia serrata. So a lot of people say when they come here, oh, Dr. Kate, I, I take turmeric. I already take a, you know, I, I cook with it or I take a tablet with the turmeric spice in it. And I think, that's awesome. But you're already doing that, that hard work. The only problem is, is that that's the yellow line for normal turmeric. That's how much effect you get out of that, okay? The type of turmeric that we use in uh, in flavonoid, that's the red line, right? So extreme difference in absorption, bioavailability, usefulness to the body from taking the spice of turmeric right here to this turmeric that's bound to fenugreek. So that's one of the things that you worry about a little bit with. with um, nutraceuticals and trends in health is that people talk about turmeric. Great, turmeric's awesome. And they think they're set, right? Because they take a little, or they cook with a little turmeric in their curry, but really the potency of it isn't enough to make that big of a difference. So
So we're always looking for ways to make these things that we know that are good better and easier to absorb. And if you look back, this is all the things that turmeric has been studied for and has shown good for you, right? So I underlined headaches. But I mean, you name it, turmeric's good for it. So that's a nice thing. I mean, that's why we say that this is an anti-inflammatory, not an anti-headache, right? It does a lot of other things too. So a lot of stuff on turmeric, ginger root, specific for migraines. So that's one to consider as well. A lot of other things that ginger is good for. This Boswellia serrata as well, headaches. I thought it was interesting that it helped with um, PMS, right? We talked about that hormone component. So that might be another multifactorial way that we go about this. So that's Boswellia serrata. Again, it comes from a plant, but a lot of your itis is on here, right? The anti-inflammatory work of that. Uh, coming back to more root causes, we have to mention that joint dysfunction of the cervical spine, right? When we come back and, and talk about, okay, what can we do chiropractically? What do we have to do to get at that joint directly and make sure that it's not causing these issues? So that joint dysfunction involves a bunch of different things. It's not just the joint, right? It's the tendon, it's the ligament, it's the muscles, it's the nerves. So we have to make sure that we're addressing all of those things which chiropractic adjustments do to an extent, right? But there's a lots of other tools that we can use. Acoustic compression is a big one that we will use here at DBC. Um, but massage therapy, active release technique, acupuncture, right? A lot of those different things also affect that joint in a really positive way. Um, I uh, had a patient who I'd seen a while ago and suffered, suffered, suffered from headaches. And we tried a lot of things. We tried nutritional approach, and she did great with that. And we tried, you know, we tried detox, and we tried all of these different things, and nothing seemed to help the headaches. She felt better in general, but we couldn't get at the headaches. And I, I begged her, I pleaded her, please let me adjust your neck. I know it's going to help. It's going to be a good thing. And she was just too nervous to do it. And so I always wonder, you know, I just have this kind of, in the back of my mind, what if we'd been able to get at that joint? What if we'd been able to actually release those muscles and nerves? So it's one of those things that I always encourage my patients to at least try. It's certainly not everything, but most of the time, it's at least part of the picture when it comes to headaches. Mm -hmm. So, because yeah, it's really, it really helps a lot, it seems. But if your neck is like, if your muscles are tight and everything around your neck and then you adjust it, aren't your muscles just well, and that's why you have to do the rest, right? It's not the only thing. Well, unless you want to get adjusted three times a week for the rest of your life, right? Which some people do that, right? That's how some chiropractors, because they don't do the rest of this stuff. They just want to adjust. And they see, I mean, not everybody's like that, right? But they do see some pretty incredible symptom relief. And if that's your option, right? If it's either get adjusted three times a week and not have migraine headaches that debilitate me or not get adjusted and have migraine headaches, right? I can understand why people would choose to do that. I think there's more to the picture always. So and I agree with... Doing the massage and the acupuncture and all that too. Well, and all of the other stuff we talked okay. about, okay. right? The magnesium, the B vitamins, the, you know, it's not... Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying, absolutely. But I, I often, I don't want people to overlook the importance of releasing the joint mm -hmm. when it comes to headaches. I do think that it plays a pretty pivotal, pivotal role. It's not the end all be all every time. Sometimes it is. I've had patients who've had headaches for since they were a little child and they come in and we have, we adjust them two or three times and they never have another headache and they come see me once a month you know, just to make sure. So it really depends on the person, it depends on all these multifactorial things. Um, and that's, the, that's sort of the, like I was saying before at the beginning, that's the hard thing about talking about a topic as big as headaches. You can get into all these different case studies and everybody's gonna respond a little different and until we figured this out, the headaches didn't go away or we did this and then they did or, you know, it's, it's very much a puzzle with lots of different root causes involved. But I do want to mention that whole joint dysfunction uh, component is, is pretty important to make sure that we address that as well. But there's other ways to do it, right? 
massage, acupuncture, those things can also be really helpful. So, all of that, multiple types, multifactorial, root causes, right? That's what we wanted to make sure we got through today. Who can name a root cause that we talked about? Oh, come on. Nutritional deficiencies. Nutritional deficiencies. Joint, joint dysfunction. Stress. Okay, yep. Tension. Mm -hmm. Yep, the tension. What about some of the trickier ones we don't often associate with headaches? Hormonal. There we go. Toxic. Detox. Nice work. Yeah, so a lot of different components, right? Neurotransmitters. I think that was the other one. GABA glutamate. That's a weird one. I know, it's super abstract. But that neuroexcitotoxicity, I mean, that's, you don't want to ignore that, right? I mean, that's kind of a big deal. That causes issue, other issues down the road, too. Um, but when we look at something that multifactorial, sometimes it can feel discouraging, right? It can feel like, oh, everything's wrong. How am I going to fix this, Dr. K? That this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this. No, 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 we look at that as a positive thing because that means we have multiple options for treatment. That means we have things that we can actually do as opposed to saying, yeah, well, you've got migraine headaches and here's your diagnosis code and take this drug that's going to harm your body at some point, right? Oh. So this is a good thing. We want to be able to get to all of these multiple factors because that means that we can do better. We have safer, longer lasting solutions. It takes a little bit of work. It's not as easy as popping a pill, but it saves you saves in the end. The other thing that's really important to note about headaches is that often it takes time to see those results. Things like detoxification, that doesn't happen overnight. Balancing your hormones doesn't happen overnight. Some of these inflammatory issues or replenishing your body, it doesn't happen right away. So often we look for, in our patients, decrease in frequency, decrease in severity, right? Those are the things that we look at. Typically, it's not like that woman who had two adjustments and she was good to go. Usually, it takes a little bit more work. But we can get there. We've got options to treat. That's what I've got for you tonight. Thank you for coming, all six of us. Thanks. I hope it wasn't too much information all at once. Do you have questions? Anybody? I know we kind of took questions in the middle. That was fun. So I'm kind of, you know, so I think for sure I have the multiple, not the skeletal thing. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, know. yeah. yeah. And, um, but I think that, like, the magnesium also helps me. Sure. Maybe we just need to take more? Yeah, I'm thinking, because I've been only at 200. That'd be a good first start. You know, and that's sometimes the nice way to do it is just process of elimination, right? If you have a suspicion of something that might be involved, treat it. You know, that's the nice thing about natural medicine is you don't have to be nervous about, you know, you'd, I understand why if you were treating it with pharmaceuticals, how you wouldn't just want to take a drug to take a drug. But taking magnesium just to take magnesium, you know, there's, uh, aside from very rare circumstances, there is no harm in that, especially if you know you're deficient. So I like to do it that way, just kind of tick things off my list, you know? Process of elimination can be, can be a really good method if you've got some intuition. And I find taking an Epsom salt bath is another good way to get magnesium. magnesium, plus you get the benefit from the hot water and relaxing. True. I even have patients that do, um, They'll do a foot soak if they don't have a big enough bathtub or they don't like baths. Hmm? Say it again. Yeah, they'll do like a foot soak. So they'll get warm water up to here and they like to sit with their feet in that with the Epsom salts um, instead of taking, you know, if they're just trying to get magnesium in, that can be a good way to. I get the uh, Epsom salt at uh, Casco, six pounds. Oh, sure. Yeah. There's nothing magical about it. <coughs> yeah, you don't have to worry about the magnesium form then. Get a pharmaceutical grade. They help? Totally. Yo! The warning's in it, guys, on that, it just says if you're a diabetic to check with your doctor. Totally. Yeah, and with any skin issues, I agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for coming out. I really appreciate it.
It's good to see all your faces. You guys are dismissed. Like, get out of here? No, no, I just mean, don't feel like you have to hang around and stare at me if you don't want. Thank you. Oh, that's very nice.